it's the same for every individual, same for every company, same. And you, if you understand this, then you understand there, well, there are three things. Um, the first is look at your income, your expenses and your savings. And then do a stress test so that you get yourself secure. If you were to lose your income or if the income were to fall beyond a certain level and you play that out, maybe that means you go get unemployment insurance but, or, or whatever, how long can you live in an acceptable lifestyle and do you have a savings that is adequate for that? Okay, so what you do is you calculate, if I lived in a simpler lifestyle and I had this amount of earnings, um, how many months, how many months or years could I live acceptably? Then you look at your, what, what do you put the money in? What do you save in? Don't you worry, and, though, that there's a, a level of financial literacy? So you're, you're saying the basics, right? And there's no question, like, get your blocking and tackling right before you start trying to get fancy. But, uh, Ray, I have legitimately started losing sleep over, like, how we help the average person through this. Um, I'm not a guy. I don't lose sleep over much. But when I stop and think about most people, I think the stat is the average American if they're hit with a surprise $500 bill, um, they're not able to make it. They are living month to month. You've got 30 plus million people now um, out of work. It's, you know, it trying to figure out like um, definitely basics, right? Uh, you've got make sure that you're spending less than you make. Austerity first. Cut, cut, cut. Get your expenses down to as low as they can, 100%. Um, what, what I'm hoping for is that there's... Um, I don't know. There's something that we can see in in this kind of transition where either you've got a new rising power um, and there's opportunity with that. I, I'm trying to find that sort of ray of hope for people of what they can do to be proactive, either to generate more income if they've lost their income or um, to be more proactive in their 401k. I think about personal finance the way I think about health. And right now, I worry that people are outsourcing everything to somebody else, to the government. They're, they have a wait and see approach. Um, and what I'm desperately trying to figure out for myself is what level of proactiveness of, of learning about their health they can do to try to weather this storm. Because short of just saving um, and cutting expenses, and maybe that's it, maybe there, there isn't any more that they can do. But I guess that's my direct question. Is there something well, I, more? Uh, uh, I mean, you, you know the parts, right? It's it's income, expenses, and savings. Okay. Now you can go get the money. Maybe the money comes in and you say, okay, my unemployment benefits are going to be this or my this is. The, but um, those are the parts. Then the issue is uh, how clever are you at uh, dealing with those? Parts? Well, let me ask it another way then. Who th who should they be voting for? Like when you talk about a beautiful deleveraging, which one you should probably um, define that. So you've you've looked at this stuff so many times. It's really really quite breathtaking. Um, that there are ways to do this well. There are ways to do this poorly. Uh, you know, we're in an election year. I consider myself like the most apolitical human being on the planet. But when I stop and think about, okay, well, if I'm an average person, and let's say that I'm really doing my best, I'm doing the blocking and tackling. I'm saving what I can save. Um, I've cut my expenses back. I'm, I'm earning, you know, what I can. Let's hope that they either have kept their job or were able to quickly get another job. Um, how should they be thinking? Like, what are, what is the right way to go through this deleveraging at a, um, a political level? Maybe politics isn't the right word, but like at, at a higher level. Well, I'm, I'm you know, w w I don't know what you want me to say. I think that uh, each person should understand that there's a certain level of basic understanding. First, take care of yourself. And then, you know, you hope that you have uh, uh, smart people who I think will most important thing is that they're smart in being able to engineer an economy 
that will increase the size of the pie as well as divide the pie well. And then also um, that this is done in a non-antagonistic way. Um, smart people working together in a bipartisan way have the capacity of managing this well. So if I was giving political advice, and that's not what I do, but if I was giving political advice, the most important thing I think is um, who can do this, who's got the intelligence to do the engineering, plus to do it um, in a manner that we are not fighting with each other. That what history has shown us is that when things get difficult, people get stressed, and they get they can get angry and they could all fight with each other and that produces the next leg of a terrible economy because the economy won't work efficiently if people are fighting with each other the system doesn't work well so one would have to say um, you know who's going to bring the country together behind sensible i would say bipartisan programs because if you don't have that then you have a form of revolution and you don't have good management. And that's the greatest risk, I would say, politically. So looking at the historical perspective, um, who has done this well? And then what have been the stakes that have led to literal revolution? When you say who has done it well, what do you mean? Um, what countries or what periods of time has going through this kind of crisis been managed well so that we come out the other side with as little sort of um, pain and suffering as possible? Well, an example of well would be the differences in um, the way Roosevelt did it. Um, so again, 1929 to 32, interest rates hit zero, they print money, we had a large wealth gap, and then they s sat down and they figured out how do we keep it orderly and how do we change the circumstances with um, whether it's taxes or um, how do you reorganize it so that the system works well? There is a risk also at the same time because the world is going through that. There's a risk of conflict. So in Germany, Hitler came in power in 1933 and he came in power in 1933 because there was a lot of internal fighting as to, to try to bring produce order because everybody, the left and the right, you know, the communists and the fascists, and they're all fighting about wealth because everybody's fighting about wealth when you have a downturn. And then they need the they were democracies Four democracies existed then that chose not to be democracies because they became so disorderly that they wanted some strong leader to take charge and run the country. And then, of course, we had a bunch of strong, those types of leaders and then they had a war. That's how World War Two happened. So when you look at that, uh, you know, th that's kind of the political landscape. But back to the average man in terms of his finances, I would say the important thing is those three elements to have a plan and maybe to have a plan with uh, both your family. You know, um, how do you get down uh, when things got tough and, and, you know, and then you have to look at, um, you know, what happens in policy. Well, policy um, is a, depends on the person. Some people would understand more about policy than other people. If if you know, so it depends so, on uh, so, what they should do. It depends on what they're able to do well. As we um, sort of step back and start taking a longer view of this. What's the role that you see education playing in? I've sort of, when I grew up, it was just assumed I was going to go to college. Um, I did go to college and I would have for a very long time told everybody they should be going to college. Now I've sort of cooled off on that in terms of the debt that people are getting into. I know you and your wife are working a lot in the school system there in Connecticut. Um, how do you, how do you think about that? What's the importance of education in, you know, when, when, we start thinking about protecting um, successive generations. How much of that comes down to education? Uh, education is is the most important thing. Um, I I was um, raised with a very modest economic background. My dad was a jazz musician. My mom was a stay at home mom. 
Um, and but I was lucky to have uh, parents who cared for me. And I went to a public school and I got a good education and I came out to a world of equal opportunity. And I believe that those are fundamental necessities that um, that you have to know how to have an education of, you know, facts like um, you have to know how to read, write and arithmetic. But you also um, have to know how to behave well with others, to be a good citizen, a, operate in a civil way, to be able then to go into jobs. And that those jo that education um, can be um, anything that works. I think the big thing is, you know, three big things on, on what I think work should be. Um, uh, make your work and your passion the same thing and make it economic. If, if, if it works, that you love your work, you'll probably be better at your work. Um, and then you find the, um, so you, you want those things. And then the, then there's the economics of it. And so it could be anything from learning, um, trades, um, um, whatever it may be. Education certainly does not have to be college. College is, uh, overemphasized and um, having a, a good productive career. When I watch the, these remarkable people who are on the front lines of dealing with this virus situation, and I look at them, the great, some of the greatest people are the people who have the capabilities of doing certain things that are not, have nothing to do with going to college and they're on the front lines and they're contributing a lot. And so we, uh, so in education and civility, but that means that there has to be equal opportunity. So yes, what my wife and I have done, um, is, um, we're particularly, um, um, heartbroken or disenchanted with, um, poverty affecting, um, children in and high school students having the equal opportunity of education. So our particular focus in Connecticut, um, we made a, a donation, a large donation, a hundred million dollar donation to the state of Connecticut for them to match um, and are working to get those um, students uh, through high school and, but it could be trade school um, and into jobs and to be able to be uh, productive. So you look at all societies and it, these are the things that matter most. The society um, becomes a fairer society when there's equal opportunity for education. And also it becomes a more productive society because the opportunities when extended throughout the whole population means that you get more people on the basis of merit. Right now, that system is not operating in a good, effective way. For example, people in the top 40% of income will spend about five times as much money on their children's education than those in the bottom 60%. And that's, not, that's, that's neither fair nor productive. So I think that these types of questions are gonna have to be examined by policymakers in a bipartisan way as we go through this. But yes, in answer to your question, you know, it really starts with good total education, the good raising of children in terms of their actual formal education and their informal education, and then going out and having an environment of equal opportunity. So one thing that I know you have leveraged to tremendous effect, and this is the very thing I took from principles that changed my life, is um, to stress test your ideas, to put them out there, to ask, how do I know I'm right? So like I said, I've, I've really been losing sleep over how I can be most helpful in um, helping people navigate um, all of what's happening. And, and I have come to a conclusion that could be pure delusion. And I would love to know what you think. It's along the lines of education, which is why I was asking about that. So my obsession is skill acquisition. 
I think that, so the advice that I've been giving to people, if you've lost your job or not, like we have spent probably the last 10 years, maybe more in an employee ease market. They've really had this election. They've been able to put a lot of pressure on employers. And now you're seeing a flip and you're seeing, this is going to be an employer's market. Um, there's going to be a lot of people, obviously there's north of 30 million. Now it's going to be a lot of people looking for work. And my thing is, if you want to get your ideal job, you want to make your passion something that you're able to pursue, you've got to be able to outperform other people. And I would say the same thing to a kid that's coming up, somebody that's about to graduate, whatever, like you've got to be better than the next person. You've got to build a skill set that allows you to excel. And my thing is like you, you are living proof of one simple thing. If you can outperform people, there really is no cap to how far you can go. You put your money where your mouth is when it comes to an investment strategy, obviously with Bridgewater, um, you guys have just outperformed people. It's really been quite extraordinary. And yes, people need to save. Yes, they need to um, focus on where uh, you know they're getting their income from. Um, they need to practice austerity measures, all of that. But ultimately, people can propel themselves forward if they're out there learning, growing, getting better, pushing, I would go so far as to say, even being aggressive to try to continue to move up. Um, but it comes down to recognizing that skills have utility. They actually let you do something. They let you out invest somebody. They let you build a better house or a better bridge. Um, and so what I want to see people do through this time, I, I just think most people will be obliterated mentally. They're going to get scared. They're going to panic. They're not going to be able to think clearly and they won't put themselves on a path to excel. Um, so wonder what, what am I missing there? Because I know that people don't, that is not a popular thing to say right now. Not something that I get a lot of negative feedback from people. It's like basically pull yourself up by your bootstraps. So I'd love to understand like where the flaw is in that thinking, um, where when you talk about the, um, they're not being equal opportunity, one, what can people do to write that ship at a personal level? I get, I get at the higher up systemic, the way that we address it through policy and things like that. But at a personal level, is there, is there something people can do? Well, I think you're exactly right. I think that, uh, that, uh, though is short of specifics and, um, you know, that particular action. And the question is, um, who can help them? So yes, um, if they're wily, and hardworking and clever enough, they still need triangulation and help to find out where is the training program? What is that skill? They, ha they can't do it alone. They have to do it with the help. I, um, I, and I would recommend, you know, I did two 30 minute videos. One is principles for success at 30 minute YouTube video, and it's about an approach to life that a lot of people, something like 14, I don't know, a lot of people have seen this. And I would say um, it's worth your 30 minutes, I think, in terms of an approach to life. And then there's also, if you're interested in the economy, I did a, a 30 minute video, how the economic machine works in 30 minutes. And that had a lot of views, more 14 million, I think. And it was like, so um, I can't tell them in this very brief interview how we're going to exactly who will get them that training and that capability. But I think you're right. Skill that you love, sell, that sells, is what you need. Now you go to each person has their own particular way of possibly getting that. To some case, it might be a um, start low in an organization and work your way up. To some cases, it may be a government training program. To some in some cases, it may be a relative or a friend who can get you going and so on. Uh, as I said, one of my main principles is there's always a path out there. You just don't happen to see the path now. So you have to find the path. If you find that path and you can't find it alone, the way you find that path is to speak to other people, get many ideas by other people. And then, you know, you have to keep yourself trial and error. You got to keep at it. Like when you're getting a job or getting a skill, 
It's a lot of trying. And so that requires a certain amount of discipline. And if you have a discipline problem, get help with the discipline problem. Have somebody kick you out of bed or whatever it is that um, you can get there. There is a path. You just don't see the right path at the moment. I look at three major forces that are happening now, um, haven't happened in our lifetimes, um, but have happened many times in history. And those three major forces are the creation of a lot of debt and the printing of a lot of money to buy that debt, because particularly because the government is running large deficits and so they don't have enough money, so that government has to print that money. So that creation of all of that, that debt and its financial implications and its economic implications is one force. The second force is um, the internal conflict, the amount of conflict that's internally largely due to the largest wealth gaps that we've had since the 30s. They, um, and that produces populism of the left and the right, particularly when there are financial difficulties. The third force um, is the rising uh, power, the um, challenging the existing power, um, largely in the form of uh, China and to some extent Russia. Um, so well, let's call it the great power conflict, because in 1945, you know, there's there's this cycle. You have a war, then after a war, you have winners, and the winners determine the rules of the game. And then there's this evolution of others becoming more competitive, and then you have a conflict again. Um, for who's in control. So we have that dynamic taking place. So those three influences, the financial, the <clears throat> internal conflict, external conflict uh, influences are having a dominant um, influence. I learned before that when I was surprised, um, often it was because of things that hadn't happened in my lifetime before, but happened in history because of that reason. I went back and uh, studied history the, the last 500 years on these cycles. There are big cycles that last about 75 years, give or take about 50 years and, and uh, of rises and declines. And I put that out because I think it's so important people understand that I put it out in a book called The Changing World Order, and in a free video called The Changing World Order. So when we look at each one of those, they're important. I also learned in studying history that there were two other influences that were very big, and you could see them. Uh, the first was acts of nature, such as droughts, floods, and pandemics. The changes over time in uh, the evolution over time of people's learning and the technologies they make. So I'd say there are the really five big influences that drive everything, and they are the money and debt economic influence, the internal conflict, the external conflict, the nature uh, influence, um, and the, let's call it the technology influence. So as we go now into this, uh, it's important. Again, um, I put it out as a free video on YouTube so that people could see it easily. And um, when we get into whatever we're going to talk about, it'll be certainly in the context of those things. And since they each affect each other, it produces what I call the big cycle. The animation that you put out in conjunction with your book, uh, Principles for Dealing with a Changing World Order, have influenced my thinking around this moment more than anyone or anything else, it it makes it seem so uh, predictable from a historical perspective when you look at that big cycle and you see how it repeats. And so as you went through the last 500 years, one thing that you make very clear in the book is that the, the rise and fall of empires, the rise and fall of a reserve currency, they go in this six cycle trend. And the 
uh, the part that I always find unnerving is phase six is basically war and collapse. And so you have that previously dominant power loses its position, loses its status as a reserve currency, and it loses it for pretty predictable reasons in the three forces that you were talking about in the beginning, discounting the the fourth force, which I don't think in every cycle you always had, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but you didn't always have a pandemic or anything like that. But the fact that we're living in a moment right now where we have all of them. And so we've got you know, not only is, is it a moment of massive technological disruption right now, good and bad, but we've got the money printing, uh, the the meme on the internet is money printer go burr. Uh, so we've got, you know, printing because of COVID. We've got printing uh, coming off of printing because of the 2008 collapse. Um, and now we're again seeing this cycle repeat itself. So I've heard you say that it, that we're in somewhere in phase five, which is as the empire begins to decline, as you have a rising superpower, as the debt bubble is getting out of control. With that perspective was what happened with the SVB bank collapse. Was that something that you knew, okay, something like that is coming or was that a surprise to you? No, uh, it, it was, it was obvious. Um, look, um, if you just let's, I, I want to talk about the mechanics really. So, I'm so eager to pass along an understanding of the mechanics so people mm. themselves can do the mm. analysis. Um, so one man's debts are another man's assets. Um, okay. So what happened? The government had to sell a lot of debt. And <clears throat> when it sold a lot of debt, there were a lot of entities that bought a lot of bonds, government bonds. Um, and money was very easy, which meant that short-term interest rates were very low. Um, and money was almost being, it was actually being given away because they had interest-only loans and interest rates were less than 1%. And you didn't have to pay back principal. So you could go get money and so that created um, a lot of debt, and it created hmm, a lot of um, bu buying of government bonds. So what happened to um, Silicon Valley Bank um, is uh, what happened to what happened to many many entities all around the world, not just banks. They um, what what does a bank do? A bank takes in deposits typically or debt in some way, and then it buys debt. It can do that in the form of making a loan, or it could do that in the form of buying a government bond, buying debt. And then when interest rates went up, the value of that debt went down. The money they had to give to depositors became more and more expensive. And also depositors wanting them to be competitive looked at money market rates or other rates and withdrew money from the bank to because they had better uses. Okay, so what that that leave them with, it's a banking problem that has happened literally for thousands of years. That um that what they do is the depositors, you know, want their money back. And they're holding assets that are, in this case, have gone down in value. So they're broke. Let, let me let me put a fine point on that. Sorry, before you move on, I, I don't know that people really understand this. Is, is this a, um, it seems to be a necessary result of fractional reserve banking, meaning that if you deposit $10 to me, I only need to keep, and I think this is actually accurate, I only need to keep a dollar. And so the other $9, I can actually put to work in terms of loans to other people or investments. And that puts us in a position where, okay, you gave, technically you're giving the bank a loan. A deposit isn't just, oh, my money is in a vault somewhere. I've given the bank a loan. The bank is going to go do things with that of varying degrees of risk. In the case of SVB, 
they thought I'm doing the least risky thing, which is I'm buying government debt. The government is going to back it. The government, especially the U.S. government, can actually print money if they had to to cover that, which they did in this case. But if a lot of people go to the bank at the same time, known as a bank run, and say, I want all of my money, the bank goes, whoa, 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 I don't have that money. And so I have all these assets. And as long as those assets remain liquid and I can liquidate them in a timely fashion, then sure, as long as the requests for people's deposits back are coming at a reasonable rate, all is well. But when you get a lot of people coming at once and you have the the investments that they've made have gone down in value, now you get a perfect storm. Exactly. I think you said it very well. Um, You're allowed to be in the business. Let's call it one tenth. It's actually less than one tenth is your Whoa. money. Whoa! Uh, but let's call it one tenth. You, um, you have a certain amount of money up. They give you the deposits. You invest the money within these general guidelines. So, for example, government bonds are safe from default. So you buy the government bonds. You think you're making a spread, and then what happens is the government bonds go down in value. At the same time as the people say, hey, I want to go take my money and put it someplace else. So you don't have enough money. And central banking works like that, except the government can print the money. So the risk and when it's a government is not that you won't get the money back unless, in, like in this particular case, for a bank, it goes down in value. So you ain't going to get that back. You're going to sell it. But anyway, you described it very well. You, what, you, what happens for the economy as a whole is then they print the money because they don't want defaults. There's a tolerable amount of defaults, and then you get past a tolerable amount of defaults, and it just crushes everything. And so they print the money. Okay. And so this thing with the bank is not a Silicon Valley bank is a loan issue. It's not a banking issue. It is a global issue in terms of all around the world, all sorts of entities, pension funds, um, um, insurance companies, um, all around the world. Uh, There was a lot of the buying of these government bonds, which have gone down in value. And if you then take it and you say, what's the value of those? Those have gone down. And the cost of money is high. And so the world is leverage long, okay? Long, meaning they own stuff, and they borrowed money to own it, and it's going down in value. How nightmarish does that scenario become? So you've got your money locked up in something for a long time, but it's declining in value. Is this like a classic moment where we can look at this big cycle and go, oh, we know where this goes, like the the music has stopped, everybody, or no, it, it's a bit harder to judge than that. I think it's pretty easy to judge on a, um, you know, an intermediate or longer term basis because there, there's a choice, right? Um, the, the, the predominant, the, the big issue is, you know, okay, the government can come in and print the money and give money to anybody they want to give money to. But when they do that, that typically devalues the money. So if, think about it, if you're holding a bond, you know, you got a claim on money, Um, but the claims are too much. So, um, So one way or another, you're either not gonna get back that money in full, or, you're going to um, get back money that's worth less because they print Whoa. the money. Oh, Ray, I've never heard anybody say it like that. So let me just make sure that I understood that. Uh, the government has effectively issued too many bonds. So people have, they're holding- and a lot of companies and a lot of other things too. Okay, very good point. So we're not just buying the bonds from the government, we're buying corporate bonds, municipal bonds, like anybody that wants to put some debt out into the market. Uh, government, of course, in fact, I'm actually curious, uh, what's the ratio roughly, if you know this, between corporate debt and government debt? 
Well, right now, I, I couldn't give you the uh, uh, you know number exact number off my, the top of my head, but there's um, um, household debt, um, corporate debt, and government debt. Yeah, that that's terrifying. So uh, even if you took every dollar that our entire country makes, I think it, it's true globally. If you took every dollar that we make globally and tried to pay off the debt, you wouldn't be able to do it. Well, that's right. But it's not expected to pay it off in a year. Sure. I want to go sure. back to my main point to make this clear. If you're holding that debt, um, you are holding something that will money will come back uh let's say if the and the government can print the money or, but if the money's hard if that's going to be good money that's coming back it's going to be hard for those entities to pay back because it's a lot relative to their income and cash flows to pay it and that means that the default risk rises. However, because it, you don't, it, you're holding that, it, it means that the debt will be bad one way or another. It's either bad because they don't pay it, it needs a haircut for them to pay it, or because they do pay it with money that is going to be printed to come back so when you look at that you're um and that problem occurs when there's a lot of debt assets and a lot of debt liabilities so think of it this way just want to make this clear when there was the position that interest rates got a lot below the inflation rate you're losing buying power. There's no good reason to own that. Um, and there's a change in psychology because um, before there was, um, I own bonds, the bonds go up in value as interest rates go down. So I'm getting a price appreciation, even though I'm getting you know, let's say a low interest rate, but inflation isn't a problem until it's a problem. Then when it's a problem, because they print so much money and they put it out, then inflation goes up and a light bulb goes off. That light bulb used to be, okay, how much am I earning? Okay, I'm not earning much, but it's okay. The price of the bond or whatever's gone up and but anyway I'm holding it and it's safe and then people realize it's not safe because I'm losing money to inflation so now you have the central bank wanting to rectify that imbalance by you know real interest rates were minus 1.7% meaning that inflation was chipping away at your buying power. Yes, if I look at inflation index bonds as an indicator um, or other indicators, I'm losing percentage points to inflation by holding that bond. Hmm. And then when they, and, and people realize that, well, you don't want to do that. And then the other side of it was you want to buy, buy and borrow and buy stuff because you know, money's free. So companies borrow and buy stuff and individuals borrow and buy houses because it interest only loans on the houses. I mean, like, okay, I can buy a house, I can buy an apartment. And so, but that creates the imbalance where it's terrible to be a lender um, and a creditor. And it's good to be a borrower and and do that so that imbalance takes place it produces inflation and then when it produces inflation and so on and then you you I, then you say i don't want to own these things anymore 
And then, it, and also um, the Federal Reserve says, I better fight inflation. They change things. And so by raising interest rates to levels in which it goes from minus 1.7% in inflation index bonds to plus 1.7%, and it makes it, um, and it raises um, the short-term interest rates, you know, real interest rates much higher, then lo and behold, all the people who did all those things get hurt okay they borrowed they bought bought the bonds they bought all of those things and all of those debt instruments um and also companies look at the companies that are affected because yields got so low um tech companies and others those who have a dream i'm going to they don't have to necessarily make profits. They're selling a dream and the money's got to be invested. And so you see all of that change radically when those that tightening of monetary policy. So now you sit there and have a lows. So when you're looking at the big picture, you look at, you've got, it's, think of it as all like banking. You're holding all these financial assets. What is the value of a financial asset? It has no intrinsic value. Its only value is what it can buy. But there are many, many more financial assets out there. The most financial assets out there that there's ever been relative to the value of stuff to buy. There's too many claims out there. It's, it's like um, musical chairs. Okay, if everybody says, oh, wait a second, let get, let me get my stuff. Let me convert my debt assets. You know, and I want to I want to get my stuff. I want to get real stuff. Um, that's a, that's a real problem. And so that's the global picture um, on the first of those five influences. Right. The fact that it's happening with the other influences is very important because they affect each other. So this financial picture, by the way, is the same as in the 1930 to 45 period and the same as they were throughout history. Yeah. For people that don't know, that's World War II. Just to, uh, well, It started with a financial crisis that th and then caused internal conflict. Mm -hmm. What do we do about the financial crisis? The populism of the left and populism of the right in this internal fighting. And four countries that were democracies chose not to be democracies because of the conflicts that were existing. The poll, um, And those countries were... Uh, um, Germany, uh, Italy, J uh, Spain, and Japan, and because there's a lot of internal conflict over wealth and when you have that. And so that creates a lot of internal disorder, a lot of fighting, okay? In, in some ways, almost civil war forms everywhere, some form of civil war. Who wins the internal war? And of course, that happens also at the same time as there's the external conflict. So first of all, everybody's fighting over resources. You have populists come to power, and the populists are not compromisers the way democracies work. Yeah, let's fight. I'm going to fight for you. This is, Don't worry. I'm not in the middle. I'm not going to compromise. And you've got to pick a side. And so the moderates, um, there's no place for moderates. You've got to pick a side. And the sides are, um, let's say, internally in the com country, the left and the right, and externally, you know, um, I don't know, the Americans and the Chinese, or the Americans, okay, and you got to pick a side and fight. And so that becomes the dynamic that is these periods of time. And these periods of time have typically lasted about 10 to 15 years. 
and you and they have various symptoms to it. So in the book, I I write out, yeah, there's like a disease, like a cancer. Um, you see stage one, two, three, four. If you have these things, you could look at it and you could diagnose and you see it moving from stage one to two to three to four to five and to six. You could see that taking place. And each time you come closer to um, a, a bad set of circumstances, bad financial circumstances and bad fighting over things. Yeah, so this is where um, this gets really breathtaking. So you've talked a lot about this idea that there are things, you even mentioned at the beginning of this episode, there are things that have not happened in our lifetime, but they happen over and over and over. And so it is very easy for me as somebody born in the 70s to think, oh, war isn't the thing that happens in the US, it's something that happens elsewhere. Populism isn't something that happens in the US, it's something that happens elsewhere, but it, it does happen uh, we're seeing it ratchet up right now because of that. Um, I heard you once say, and I think this is really important for people to understand about the the internal conflict. In fact, you and I bumped into each other in Dubai and I was saying, you know, Ray, as uh, given everything that's going on, how do I think? How do I think about where to live? Whatever. And you said, Tom, the only thing that matters is how people are with each other. And for whatever reason, it really hit me that time what you meant by that. And I understood the, the importance of this conflict. And what I heard you say previously is that in the French Revolution, it was the moderates that got the guillotine. It's like you, you are forced, because I consider myself very centrist in nature, and you find yourself, as things escalate, being forced to take a side, which the French Revolution one gave me pause. I was like, eh, not, not how I would want to end up as a moderate. Um, Really fast, going back to the that this is a global moment. It's a predictable part of the process that stage five, the debt is too much. Interest rates are now going up to keep inflation from running away. We printed money like crazy. You've got the rise in conflict. Is is the when we printed money, when the Fed printed money to backstop uh, the what looked like it was going to be a potential contagion from SVB. Obviously, I think there were five banks that ended up failing. Um, is this now contained, or is is what the Fed did just going to forestall something that's inevitable? Um, the dominoes are uh, beginning to fall. I mean, okay, you know, you know what the next dominoes are, and you can imagine the uh, the dominoes. So, for example, um, they're not going to buy the debt. Um, a lot of them are not. Th those who are who bought the debt and have too much debt and have debt losses um, on government debt are not going to buy that uh, buy more of that debt, for example, and therefore. When the government uh, sells more of the debt, um, there's not going to be an adequate number of buyers for that debt. Uh, you know that um, those who are hurting because they have those losses um, won't make loans. And a lot of those loan loans went to real estate, particularly commercial real estate. And you know that for various th reasons in commercial real estate, that you're, um, you, 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 we don't use it the same way and so on. So you're going to have problems in commercial real estate. You know that this kind of m money was also fi financing um, venture capital and private equity um, entities that also have cash flow problems, challenges. And so you know that that funding is not going to be there in the same way. You know, as a result of these things, that a number of entities will cut costs and in their various ways. And so depending on the on that, the job market is changing. And you, you know, you see it, for example, in tech jobs and, and other, you know, if you're in some of those areas that are getting squeezed. And you see the same thing, by and large, 
you know, happening internationally. So you can see also that if you said, what is the value of those assets that are being held, that that value has gone down a lot. And because it was bought on leverage, as you described, because it is bought on leverage, there are bad um, losses in different places. And then the question is, what are you going to do with those losses? In most cases, quite often, they're, um, you know, don't mark them to the market, meaning don't account for them and recognize those losses, which is kind of, let's say, hiding those losses and hoping in time that they'll just over time, you know, it'll be fine. But that'll produce <laughs> a squeeze. That'll produce a problem. So I think we know those things. We know those things. And um, and that's happening at the same time as we have um, an internal conflict taking place, such as the presidential election. So we're going to come into the presidential and, and it's not just presidential election. Of course, it's a number of um, senators, congressmen, and so on, um, and who are at each other's throats about this and who are going to fight with each other. Okay. And, and fight to win. Um, not probably respect the rules as much, um, and, but fight to win for their side. And that's happening at the same time as we have um, the situation with China, most importantly, China and Russia, in terms of the issues, in terms of their things to fight over. You know, for example, even there's going to be an election in Taiwan that'll also have a big bearing on this whole thing. So there's, you know, there. We know, I think, pretty much, that we're going to have financial problems at, and economic problems at the same time as we have this internal fighting and this and external risky situation. The most important thing, I think, is to know your nature. What is your nature? What, is, what, what are your strengths and weaknesses and your likes and your dislikes? And once you know that, then you also think, what are the fits? Oh, I would like that job, and the job could pay me well. And then you figure out, okay, how do you do it? How do I get to it? But there are different people in different circumstances, so I can't answer them all now. Yeah, um, I agree with you. So I want to go back. One, thank you for the feedback that I'm, I was being super vague. Uh, I think that's really helpful. So let's start getting really specific as much as we can, knowing that people are going to be sort of at very different places as they're hearing this. Um, but I think this will be helpful. So one, the video that you're talking about, and I'll speak for you and correct me where I go astray, but I watched the video multiple times. I think it's really extraordinary. And basically to put it in a really small nutshell, it's basically go out, try things, fail a lot, learn and keep progressing. And that that's basically, if I remember right, you have like this sort of circular ascent. Um, and it's, from the failing and the learning that you ultimately make the progress. But if you put your head down, you don't want to see your mistakes. You don't want to see the flaws in your thinking. You're going to trap yourself at a plateau and you're never going to be able to push beyond that. So you've got to seek out disconfirming evidence. You have to seek out where you're weak. And in fact, one thing I will, I sort of disagree. I get what people mean. So when you say know your nature, I will say by nature. Before you get to that second part, let me just on the thing, yes, it's the looping and learning from mistakes, but it, 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 another part of it is the realization that you don't have to make your decisions in your own head, okay? That when you start to realize that you know what you're good at and what you're bad at, that a power comes to you when you start to know, uh, okay, who's the best person to give me the advice or who's the best person to lead me through this. Or when you start to know that you can go beyond what you think and your opinionatedness. 
so that you can triangulate. I call it triangulate with others so that you find three people who are really capable of giving you good advice, who will argue with each other and argue with you so you can see all sides of it and you work yourself through. So it's not just your eyes looking for the path, but it's other people's eyes looking with the path with you, knowing that you're going to have uh, successes and failures. But that power of that collective learning and triangulate well with humbleness is a great power as you go through that cycle. I love that. So um, I'll push that a step further and, and I will say this. So I'm going to be super blunt to anybody watching right now. And Ray, if you think that I'm wrong, I trust that you will jump in. No one is coming to save anybody. And that's the hard truth. And if I look at history and even if I listen, which I've listened to literally every word that you've said on this subject publicly anyway, that th this is just going to suck. Like there is going to be a, a level of brutality that most of us have not experienced in our lives. Companies are going to go under. People are going to lose their jobs. There are going to be people that are going to struggle to find their next meal. And what, what I want people to understand is just like you just said, you can triangulate, you can get people to help you think through, but I want them to understand that they can do that in a book at a library. They can do that online if they still have access to the internet, which as of right now, even just going to the library, you can get access to being online. You changed my life before you and I ever met. I read your book. I'd never, I didn't even know who you were at that point. And somebody just said, Hey, you've got to read this book. It's got really powerful ideas on trust and creating these hard principles out of all your mistakes. I read it immediately recognized that this aligned with what I call the physics of being human. It was so in line with removing my blind spots, getting people acknowledging that other people are better than me at certain things. And so while I take uh, a little bit of an exception, because I, I think that you can't say what you're good and bad at until you've been at this for a long time. You've been trying, you've been pushing, you're learning, you're failing. Because by nature, I'm lazy. I, I am not very bright. I think there are people that can process raw data far faster than I can. But I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong. I'm willing to admit that I don't know. I'm willing to admit when I make a mistake. And because of that, because I go in that cycle that you talk about of making a mistake, looking nakedly at it, not pretending I didn't screw up, asking people to point out my flaws, and then going, and now I'm going to have to do what is called deliberate practice to get better at that thing. And I don't just ask, and I don't think people can afford right now to just say, oh, what do I want to do? We're, for a lot of people, this is going to be Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You need safety, you need security, you need food, shelter. And I think it's going to come to that. And so recognizing there are people out there right now that know more than you. You are going to make a mistake, but those mistakes are huge learning opportunities. You have to admit that you made one. You have to seek people that can help you remove those blind spots. And then you have to put in the work to get better. Does any of that sound yeah. crazy? No, that, that's totally, totally right. And then um, it comes from once you have a fear that you might be wrong, but you have still the audaciousness and courage to go forward, you're a lot smarter than the person who thinks they know. There's a, there's a quote that Jefferson said, he who knows he knows not is closer to the truth than he whose mind is filled with falsehoods. And, and so when you know that, and, with, and then with your character and your determination, you go forward. The smartest people I know are the most humble. It, what, the more you learn, the more you realize, oh, I'm eager to take in. So that's right. Um, but back on your audience, I, I think your audience ranges from, um, you know, there's a wide range that you have in your audience. And I would say that there are many people in your audience who can plan for a simple lifestyle that can be wonderful. Sometimes we acquire these needs that aren't at anywhere near as big as, as we make them out to be. And, you know, um, do you have a bed to sleep in? Do you have food to eat? Do you have basic health care? Okay, if you start to think, okay, what are my needs that I really need and I'm okay. And how can I make provisions for those needs? Then once you've got that in your mind, 
you're you're free. Okay, you you can go beyond that. You, uh, that you may say, listen, oh, I can do that for a year or two years or a month or whatever. But you, I think we visualize too much the things that we're used to. One of the good things about this exercise is that you can bring it brings you back to basics. You can be brought to basics. And like I'm saying, if you have a bed to sleep in and you've got food and so on, and you have those basics and, and good relationships with people who care about you and basic health care. So if you budget for that and you figure how do you have it, maybe it isn't in the luxurious place you're in. Maybe it's in the country and so on. Once you visualize that and you get that down in your head and you say, oh, I can get that, then your stress will disappear because you, as you visualize that, in many ways, that's a happy life. It doesn't take a lot. to. There's stimulation, there's nature, there's relationships. These fundamental, wonderful things, the most important things can be obtained. And so for many of you, I think if you look at that and you budget for that, I'm seeing a number of people um, who are um, going broke. Uh, and, and I've watched this over many years. And really, it's just the adjustment process. When the, once they get to that point where, ah, you know, they have, they get settled, they're fine. It's the ambiguity, it's the worry, it's the stress. So if you do that from the beginning and you have that, that played out in your head, then you know everything from there you can play with and it's, your, it's uh, uh, icing on the cake. Yeah. So I want to yeah. emphasize you can budget for that, you can look at that, find that scenario, find what that looks like so that you know you've got it down. Then you know you're safe. Once you've got safe, Everything beyond that is luxury. I forget who the Greek um, philosopher was, maybe you remember, that used to go and he would sleep on the street like once a month or something like that in shabby clothing because he wanted to remind himself, oh, this is what I'm afraid of. And this thing isn't that bad. I mean, I always found that interesting. I take a slightly different approach. I think that is really powerful. And I think that's an important anchor for people. So my wife and I always say to each other, because look, we have been dirt poor. Um, and we have now been very wealthy. And all along the journey, we've always said to each other, look, man, if I have you, like everything else, I'm good. So literally, there are only two things I'm legitimately afraid of. There are things I don't want, but there are two things I am legitimately afraid of. Brain damage, because then I cannot build my way back. I can't have the level of fulfillment and joy that I want. And losing my wife, because a life shared to me is like the, the highest importance. Now, Having said that, I'm going to set all that aside, and I, I hope people heard you, and I hope that they take it to heart to paint a lifestyle that they can love, and it's beautiful, but it's simple, um, and you know they don't have all this overhead hanging over them. But I know thyself, as you were saying. Know what you're good at and what you're not. I've always told people, if you want a calm, peaceful life, I'm not your guy. There, there is somebody else for you to go listen to um, and, and follow that journey. If if you want to be aggressive and you want to build something that matters to you, I don't need it to be big. I don't need it to be a business, whatever. I just, people that want to express themselves, that want to get great, they want to become extraordinary at something. That's what I'm far more interested in. And so the way that I look at it is right now, it's a time where economically the chessboard has, has been flipped over. But in, in that moment, there's going to be opportunity created. And for people that, and this, my central thesis is what I said earlier. Panic is the problem. People cannot allow themselves to panic, which is why I like what you're saying. Don't, don't worry if, you're, if you lose everything, right? As long as you have the things that really matter to you. And I think that's important so people don't panic, so they can be clear-headed, so they can figure out where the opportunities are, and then they get the skill set that they need to capitalize on that opportunity, which for me is like when I... And that's why I keep saying I'm losing sleep over like, how do we get information out so that I've worked in the inner cities a lot and to get the information to somebody out there that they can triangulate, right? That that's not a rich upper class exercise. That's a, the, the information is out there. It's been put in books on a website, in a podcast, like the, the number of the world's greatest thinkers right now that you could be taking this information from, but you have to be willing to test it. You have to be willing to 
incorporate it and actually act on it and do something. So I'm not clear what's your question about that? It, not so much a question is I, I'm, I'm presenting what I think are ideas that I want people to run mm -hmm. with. Partly I'm hoping if there is a flaw in my thinking, I want you to point it out. So going back to the need for specificity. So um, we're talking about there isn't equal opportunity because there's not equal um, access to education, which I will take as the core of your thesis for generationally moving forward in a useful way. True? It's, it's a core piece, yeah. Okay, so what I'm saying is I really hope that that gets addressed and I will certainly do whatever I can. You're obviously uh, doing a massive amount there. But I also want people to not wait for someone to make that change. I want them to realize right now today they can go and learn something. They can educate themselves. You said that it's not about college. It's about getting a skill that lets you live a fulfilling, a fulfilling meaningful life um, with a meaningful career. And so I want to see people take action. But if there is a flaw in that thinking, I want to know. No, no. Um, I don't think, of course, I think it's totally right. I think uh, then the issue is going to the next step for the particulars of actually um, helping somebody. And um, and there's a combination of not only what they can do themselves, uh, but finding others who will help to take them by the hand and help to provide that guidance uh, to be able to do that. All right, so uh, finding a job, let's say, you know, you think, OK, how do you find a job? So it, it, you have to be specific. Uh, so we could say, great, find a skill. Okay, great. But literally, how do you go about finding that skill? Let's talk and about so, that. So one thing you've yeah. talked about from an um, investing standpoint is when this begins to happen and monetary policy begins to break down, uh, won't spend a lot of time describing a fiat currency, but essentially money that isn't associated to anything like gold. So you've broken that. So you said that it gets reassociated because gold has intrinsic value or rocks because it's used to build things. So what is looking at the historical perspective? What are things that are safe bets in terms of this job is going to be here in five years, that this is a, a good place to begin building that skill set? You're talking about the skill set, not the investment, I guess. Yeah, skill set. I think that that's maybe more useful for people if they've just lost their job and, you know, they're sort of just trying to make ends meet at this point. Well, in terms of, um, I think in terms of any environment, the lessons that we get over and over again is that you can't be sure what the next environment and twists and turns are. What you don't know is greater than anything you do know. So if, if you were in the airline business or you were in the hospitality business um, and that was wonderful and you liked it and everything else, all of a sudden that changed in important ways. So the important thing it more, are the more general abilities. In terms of investing, what that means is you need to know how to diversify well. That's the most important thing. In terms of any aspect in life, to know how to deal with what you don't know is more important than anything you know because the world is so much more surprising than you can really be sure of. So in a general say, sense for skills, I mean, I think, uh, and skills are part of your, what, what are your environment. You know, find out those things that, um, are, that are self-sufficient and maintain uh, flexibility. You have to know how to maintain flexibility and change well. If your career is in one area, um, you have to know how this, you have to develop the skill for changing a career. And that all comes down to knowing how to find the path, to know how to triangulate well with others. I want to talk so, about that. You've done such an extraordinary job, Ray. I, I, I truly stand in awe of being able to go and learn a new area, a new, um, element of the world, when you announced that you were going to be taking this historical view and that you were going to go backwards, I mean, something like a thousand years or however far you went back, um, how do you begin that research process? So for somebody that's like, I want to invest my time wisely, what is sort of a high level way that you approach learning in general? Well, for, for me, um, it's a lot of the alignment of the three things that I said before. 
what is my passion? Um, then, you know, knowing my nature, what is my passion? Um, and can I align my work to my passion? And then uh, does it pay adequately for me to take care of my needs? And for me, um, I'm, I do that because it's my passion, um, you, you know? And so when you find your passion that's aligned with your work, if you can do that. But how do you go I'll, about learning something new? So when you started researching the historical context of what we're going through now, is it picking up books? Is it... Um, well, for me, you, you see, I have been... My nature is I'm extremely curious, okay, and I love my game. My game is to learn about the world, interact with the world, and bet on it, and I'm very curious. So it, so it might be whatever your game is, like you've got a game, okay? That's why we're, you're interviewing me, because that's your passion, that's your game. And if you can line those three things up but, and you know your nature, because there, if you know your nature, you can find your role. You want to find the right role for you, right? It's not just go get a job and, you know, it might say, I would like to be um, an architect. Well, I mean, you have to know your nature and then you can find your role. And so I'm, I'm hesitant to say that m what is true for me is true for somebody else. So when you ask me what, you know, like, okay, those are my big things, uh, meaningful work and meaningful relationships, like relationships matter a huge amount to me. So if I can have a work that feeds my curiosity that, um, I'm passionate about and that, uh, pays me adequately. And, you know, and I do that uh, with great people. Those are the things that feed me. And so you have to know those things that feed you. Like I like the big picture. Somebody might like uh, details. You know, the, I, I, you know, you have to pick those things that are for your nature and, and align those things I'm talking about. And how did you specifically go about starting this big research project? Did it start with a book? Did it start with reaching out to historians? No, no. It's, I mean, in a sense, the journey started out when I was 12 years old and I caddied. And I, um, and, and then I, uh, I took my caddying money and I had newspaper route and I did a number of things like that. I took my odds and ends and I uh, put it in the stock market. And, you know, and um, and then I and and I got hooked on the game. Do you ever think I, about the nature of questions in that process? Like that. So I think it was Tony Robbins that said, "If you ask a better question, then you're going to get a better answer." And that basically, questions are going to control the outcome. Um, do you focus on what question you're asking and trying to answer, or is it something completely different than that? Questions, questions. That's right. It's the hunger to know. You'll you'll notice it different in people. There will be people who, wow, you listen, good question, good question, good question. Then there will be people who can't ask questions, that they're just telling you what they think. They almost, you think they're acting smart, they think they're acting smart, and they're the stupid ones. The smart ones are, oh, question, now how do I go? I have to find the answer to the question. Next question. Because the questions and the power and the pull to answer those questions and so on is the thing that drags you forward and it's excitement. Do you have a pull? Okay, what's your pull? You know, so, um, yeah, it's all in questions, I think. It's all in a journey. Life is in a journey, an adventure. That's what I'm trying to say in, in principles in, uh, for success. Or you can get, by the way, principles, um, if any of these principles are also principles in action is an app that's available on the iStore, iStore and it's free. And it has all of these things in it. But it, uh, so I don't, I, you know, because we'll, we'll separate. Um, I think people might like that. But you know, have to know your pull. And then along the way, you're going to have your adventure. 
and you're going to learn, and then you go through your phases of life. And each phase is different. Like you talked about your phase. You're in the middle of your phase in life. You talked about your wife and your relationship with her. Okay? That is a phase of life. And when you go, and by putting it in perspective, it's helpful. Um, in the back of that book, uh, Principles for Success, there's a life arc chart. And if you know where you are on that life arc and you know what the next 10 years is typically like and you know what you, the people you care about are on their life arcs, you can almost know what's coming at you and then you could start to think about it. So it's at that level of knowing yourself and knowing how these things happen over and over again that you can achieve your path. Don't be surprised. Most life is the, is the same things that happen over and over again. You're born, you probably have parents to take, take care of you. Maybe you have one, maybe you have two, but somebody does. They teach you. You have your first phase of your life where you're dependent on them and you're learning. Then you come out to your second phase of your life and then you're working and others are dependent on you and then you have that. So these things happen over and over again and, and you just have to know that path and know how to approach it. So really fast before I let you go, you're working on a new book, The New World Order, um, which I find very fascinating. And you've been publishing some of the chapters on LinkedIn. Um, what do you think the odds are, just to, to really go back to the finance side of this, um, what do you think the odds are that America remains the reserve bank and the reserve currency? Um, and if it's not us, who do you think it will be? Uh, well, all currencies eventually die and all empires eventually diminish in their other empires. And the question is essentially the pace of what, how that happens. I think that, um, but for most of your listeners, it's most likely going to happen in a way that's tolerable if you can manage it well. Think about the decline of the British Empire and you see a people who are living in London and so on. It's not that the world blows up, it's that they have to readapt and they know how to readapt. And so I think that um, it, 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 we're going to come through more difficult times. I think the next three to five years will be difficult times in ways that haven't existed in their lifetime, but has existed in other periods of time, like the 1930 to 45 period. So to be able to adapt well, to invent yourself again, to adapt and to navigate that maybe with a perspective of knowing what those other times were like is the best thing to do. So the reason I'm doing that series on LinkedIn is to help people understand what those times are like and then uh, help them be prepared. The reason I wrote the book Principles is so that it's, it's a particular approach because the same things happen over and over again for basically the same reasons. And once you get that and you have the self-discipline to know how to play the game well, then you'll be fine. So um, one, where can people connect with you right now? And then I have one last question that I want to ask. Well, I'm, um, as I say, I'm on social media and um, we um, and I'll interact with people on social media on the, the, the standards, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, face, uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram by and large. Um, but the more m the most uh, valuable stuff is if you go to uh, principles dot com, you can get the whole pile or or I would say that. Um, so of those places, you know, so. As this next three to five year um, part of the cycle hits us, what is one thing that people can do um, that you know from the historical perspective will most um, insulate them from the, the probably emotional um, and maybe financial damage, whatever you think is more important? Well, the, uh, the things that I thought about, some of the things I mentioned earlier, the plan for uh, the worst case scenario and make it terrific is one of the things. When I read Principles, it was really life-changing for me. Uh, it was before you and I had ever done an interview because what I liked about the book is exactly what you're talking about right now, this idea of a bipartisan cabinet. So in my own company, I'm not looking for people to agree with me. I'm looking for people that will challenge my ideas. I'm looking for disconfirming evidence. I want to get the smartest people that I can possibly attract to what we're doing and saying, okay, we need to disagree with each other well. 
so that we can identify the right answer. To your earlier point, you're going to be wrong so often that if you go into something thinking I'm infallible, uh, I'm going to have all the right answers, you're just headed towards disaster. So my question is, how do we set up a situation where people can disagree well? What, what is that structure? I think it starts with worry. I, I got a principle, if you, if you worry, you don't have to worry. And if you don't worry, you need to worry. Because if you worry, you'll take care of the things that you're worrying about to the best possible way. If you don't worry, and you just go headlong into these things, you're going to have a real problem. So I think um, that you have to have uh, people first realize what does that picture look like if we don't do these things, if we don't, if we don't have bipartisan, if we don't solve these problems together, if we fight. You know, you have to see the clarity of those two paths and have people choose the good path, you know, okay, we will figure this out intelligently to make the best possible thing to intelligently and together. Okay. It starts there. It's not a structure. Where does the structure come from? It comes from people. Okay. And it comes from people having a need to create a structure and a way of being. So how do we get people to worry? Well, I, well, maybe what we're doing. I mean, I think they have to worry at two levels. First, enough of us worry that we uh, vote for it or, you know, we use our voting and our others to say, let's vote on together and compromise and smart people doing these kinds of things. Um, or And that that's worrying about the society as a whole. And then there's worrying of, as an individual, if they don't do those things, how do I take care of myself? Those are the two types of worries or two types of impacts you can have, right? So I think they need to think of uh, both of those. For people that aren't familiar with Lincoln, um, how much have you looked into him? His idea of a team of rivals sounds like very similar to what you're saying about having a bipartisan cabinet. Um, is he somebody that you've looked at or? Uh, I know that uh, I know a bit about Lincoln. I wouldn't call myself an expert and I know that about him. And yeah. And I think that's really, really great. Yeah. So when, uh, whether it's at Bridgewater or elsewhere, how do you facilitate people, um, disagreeing well because let's say that you have an intern going against your chief investment officer like how would you do you take that person seriously they have little to no experience how do you set that up so that you don't waste time but at the same time you get the best ideas first of all um you explain to people and you understand yourself uh how important thoughtful disagreement is. So you remove it, you minimize it from being um, something that people view as a fight and get upset about. You have to change the attitude about disagreement so that, um, you know, if you're in disagreement, um, then one of you is probably wrong. How do you know the wrong person isn't you? And then also, you still have to resolve the disagreement in some way. And so you have to have in place, first of all, you know, an understanding and an intellectualization of that so you don't get emotionally carried away in thinking, because I disagree, that's equivalent to a fight. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to change that psychology. And then once you do that, then you have to have protocols in place for doing that. Now, you know, uh, in, in my book, you know, uh, Principles, Life and Work, in the work part of principles, I've outlined those things, those techniques that can be done um, repeatedly. Um, so you have to have a system for that. 
And, you know, and so let, let, let me make it very simple examples of that. If you and I are disagreeing and we sort of want to try to get at the truth, uh, things that you can do is to mutually agree on a mediator. So, it, um, okay, you, you could step out of your argument and say, okay, this isn't working. Uh, how should we do this disagreement? And maybe, uh, like, let's mutually agree on a mediator. Like, we both agree that that person, you know, something somebody we can trust and do it through. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good step. Then as you're doing that, carrying that through, you can also um, say, are you taking in the other person's thinking and replying to that? Or are you just blocking? And there are techniques that you can do to, do to demonstrate you've taken it in, okay, uh, like repeat the other's point and so on, and then reply to the other's point, and then do certain things like not interrupt. Or in other words, I have a rule, I call it the two-minute rule. Somebody says, okay, uh, can you give me the two-minute rule? That means for the next two minutes, I can speak uninterruptedly. So there are techniques that you can use to first understand that it's not a big fight, that there's protocols. Okay, then how do you do that in a hierarchy? Okay, there are different ways you can do that in a hierarchy. But anyway, there are many of them. And, you know, we're not going to have the time to go through them, but they're outlined in, um, you know, um, my book, Principles, Life and Work. They're in the work principles part of it. Yeah, that's something that we found really effective here is uh, rules of engagement is how we refer to it. So whether it's the two minute rule or something else, um, but ultimately getting people to understand, I'm saying this in in the context of somebody who's trying to figure out how we get uh, we know that the the big cycle has a high degree of predictability, and I'm willing to accept that maybe the U.S. can't remain the um, the reserve currency forever. Maybe we're not going to be the dominant world superpower forever, but that I want to handle that transition out as well as possible. And usually phase five to six ends with literal bloodshed, and things have to get so painful before people can correct course. And so trying to give people a framework, I know you're saying that maybe I'm, I'm looking at the structure too much, but I, I think in frameworks. So what's that rubric by which people can go into, whether it's the 2024 election, uh, whether I think right now we're still in gridlock with the budget or the debt ceiling or whatever it is, um, giving people ways to navigate through this well. And so my thing is everything begins with the goal. So what's your goal? And even just getting um, any group to agree on what the goal is. Now, once we know what the goal is, then we can start saying, okay, what people or ideas are most likely to get us there? How do you stress test an idea? How do you know? I just want to emphasize, though, uh, as you're doing that, the people have got to agree how they want to be with each other first before there's a structure. I mean, I can, we can have structure. I can create stu structure. And we could do all sorts of things. We can have a bipartisan cabinet. We can have the um, uh, uh, the um, going off for six months and doing the project. And we can do all. The, there's lots of things we can do, but you first have to change the mindset of going from a I want to win at all cost to wanting that. So all I'm saying is when you say, I want the structure and I'm a structure guy, I'm, I want the structure and I'm a structure guy too. But it takes people wanting something. And so what is the goal? Like you say the goal, you start with the goal. Okay, that we're not going to fight with each other in a dysfunctional way. Okay. That we will work together to overcome our differences that we will be good with each other. Okay, if you put those things there and then judge those things, and you sort of then say, how are we going to do that? Okay, then you do to bipartisan structure or whatever, you know, bipartisan cabinet, blah, 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 
all that other stuff, then you can come around to it. But you have to. If you're in a I will fight at all cost mode, nothing, the structure of the Constitution is not going to work. I, I'll give you my hypothesis on the only way to pull that off. And let me know if you see another option. Lord knows, I hope there is one. Uh, I've thought a lot about how you sway people into doing something that is more advantageous. I'm usually thinking about it for them. So just what's more advantageous for them. And it all ultimately comes down to you have a, a leader or a group of people for whom you're trying to earn the respect of. And by earning their respect, you do the right things. So I'll sum it up at, at the national level. We would need a leader that can actually bring the two sides together. Somebody who has a very clear vision You've, you've grimaced. For anybody that's just listening to this, uh, Ray Dalio just grimaced hard. All right, so uh, explain the grimace, Ray. It's like wishing for the tooth fairy or something. I, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it's like um, not going to the root cause of why you don't have the, that leader. Okay? If you look at history, um, this is one of the great challenges of a democracy. And when it gets into everybody fighting for their own cause with pe um, populism, they, uh, you know, and so, you know, Mussolini comes to power to make the trains run on time because it's badly managed and so on. So somebody says, give me the dictator. Give me the dict dictator and then I will, and, and I want that dictator. So that's what we're, um, okay, so how do you get that leader? Okay, it it increasingly, I'm just dealing with the mechanics. So I'm, uh, So how do you get the leader? And what do you do with the opposition? Okay, it's almost like, um, well, you you have this fighting of the various types, and do you accept losing? And then does the opposition remain and undermine everything you're trying to do? So it's almost like it gets to mob rule. That's why the dictators come to power. Okay, so that's just history, and that's all understandable, if not desirable, it's still understandable that that's the mechanics. So to wish and say, okay, we need a strong leader who will get control and make everything go all right, sounds a little bit like wishing for the tooth fairy. That, that is how dictators come to power. That is very much the scenario I would want to categorically avoid. So do you see that just as that is an inevitability? Because right now, Ray, to your own point, we are not being good with each other from what I can see. There, there is uh, certainly a broadcast signal, and maybe this is a distortion of social media, but I don't think so, certainly not given the elections of recent, there is a broadcast of a signal of massive division. In a moment of massive division, you get people fighting. In a moment where people fighting, there is a winner-take-all scenario. That's the path to dictatorship. So while my path may be wishing for the tooth fairy to want somebody who's inspiring that can unite people, um, I'll ask it pointedly. Do you just see it as an inevitability that we head towards dictatorship when you say um, have a leader that way, you're not dealing with the mechanistic determinants to say, how do you get a society that is splitting apart and operating in the way that I describe to have a leader that leads and people follow properly? Mm. Okay, you're skipping over that. You can't skip over that. Do you see a path, though, other than because the natural way that this plays out? The only path I can see is the one that I'm referring to. If you worry about the alternative, okay? If, um, okay, so if you worry, look at that. What is it? You must not have it. If the more people worry about that, 
then the more likelihood you won't have that. In other words, if you want to tilt the odds in all the different ways, I don't know, take out the ads, have conversations like this, do whatever it is and say, I worry of what's going to happen. So we must not have that. And we really must have this other alternative. I really want to buy into that other alternative. And you have somebody arguing for that other alternative, like, will you follow? Um, I'm, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, um, um, the prime Mario Draghi in Italy. Let me just tell you the story very quickly of Mario Draghi in Italy. Mario Draghi used to be um, the head of the European Central Bank, which was like being head of the Federal Reserve for a number of years. And he and I got to know each other in that. He completed that. And he's highly, highly respected. He's Italian. And Italian has, um, Italy has crazy anarchy. Like they've had an average of one prime minister a year. And so chaotic and so bad that all the political parties got together and said, we will be united under Mario Draghi. We will let him lead. We will turn it over to him. Wow. And he said, I will do that only as long as all the political parties remain united. Because if they don't remain united, we're going to get into this dysfunctional fighting. And I know it's not going to work. So for a period of 18 months, he um, uh, was prime minister of Italy and and very loved. People loved him. And then one of the political parties um, um, uh, uh, dropped out because they disagreed on his approach for, I think it was handling Ukraine. Um, and he said, okay, now I'm resigning, even though everybody wanted him to stay overwhelmingly. But he said, I can't govern under that kind of a fragmented environment. And, you know, in other words, he knew where it was going to go. So, so he resigned. And in the period, um, between him resigning and actually turning it over to the new prime minister, um, we had lunch. And um, and we were talking about these things. And wh what he was describing and what exists is the issue that we're talking about, the inability of a, a leader to be able to lead when there's so much fragmentation. And if you look at the history of democracies, um, and you go back to Plato, back Plato's Republic, he wrote the, the, the Plato. You know, a lot of people think Americans invented democracy. <laughs> it existed way back, you know, um, in the Roman and Greek times and all that. Um, and so he looked at the cycles. And what he said was, there's the cycle of these different systems. One leads to another in this way where what happens is the greatest risk of democracy is an anarchy because the fragments, it, it becomes uncontrolled. They all have their interests. They fight and they tear the thing apart. And then, so what happens after that is then you get the dictator. And um, you get, ideally, the benevolent dictator. In other words, the one who really knows how to make good things happen, and he cares about the country, he doesn't care about his personal wealth and those kinds of things, and, that, and they create that. And, okay, to create order that comes about that. And then in that cycle, after a period of time, you inevitably get the incompetent or selfish dictator. <laughs> and then you have a revolution and then you go to a democracy and so on. And these things go in cycles. And so when you're asking the question, you know, of the leader, you know, you're saying, okay, let's create a leader. And, um, 
and and have them go lead. You can't ignore the fragmentation and the inability uh, to lead in that set of circumstances. I agree with that. But if you, even in your own example, what you had in Mario is somebody that is able to garner the respect of all the different factions. Now, I understand that it ultimately broke apart, but he is the tooth fairy that I'm talking about. You need somebody that people can unite under. But it didn't work because of the, how the people behaved with each other, and it won't oh, work. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so if if we know that people aren't going to stay united for long, what you're saying is the duration that people can stay united is the duration that you can have that sort of peace, prosperity, and the second that you... How long is that duration here? I mean, let's let's look at the situation. I mean, it doesn't exist, let alone have a duration to it. Yeah. Ray, you say very troubling things in a very calm manner, which I think is probably the only way to say them. Um, all right. So as I then step back and I say, okay, the cycles are what the cycles are. You said something earlier, which I think is really important that I want to reemphasize. What's happening now is a determination from something that happened earlier. And so to some extent, you're in a better position to deal well with the way things are, the reality. I've heard you talk a lot about that. The reality is what the reality is. You need to be awake. You need to be paying attention to that reality. And then you need to base your plan of action based on the truth of that circumstance. To do that, though, one thing I think is incredibly important is people have to be able to strip their emotions out of this. Uh, I know you're a huge proponent of meditation. Are How do people get good at removing emotion from the equation so that they can see reality accurately? Well, meditation is a huge benefit for that. Um, so I really, it, it, it gives one both a calmness and a clarity and it gives one an ability almost to go ab above everything and look down on it and say okay here's how things work and uh and and an acceptance of reality it's like this serenity prayer god give me the serenity to accept that which i can't control give me the power to control that which i can and give me the wisdom to tell the difference. And, you know, just to be able to approach things in an open-minded way, like we talk about, uh, you asked the question about um, disagreement. How can I approach disagreement? Do I emotionally get into a fight about it, or do I handle it well? Meditation and those types of things, calming yourself down, viewing everything more like it's, you know, it's think of a, a reality as being like a game, like a chess game. Okay, calmly. Okay, this thing happens and what's your next move? And how does it work? Okay, very fascinating. So if you take a chess grandmaster or anybody that's really proficient at chess and you put a chess board in front of them, they, they look at the board and they don't have to analyze each individual piece, they know that pattern on the board very well. They know where you are in the game. And so that that's a chunk of information. Uh, it feels like a very similar approach to the way that you're looking at financial markets, global movements, the big cycle in that, oh, I can drop you into a scenario. You'd look at a few key pieces of information. You'd know where we are in the cycle. So, I mean, starting with the three forces that we talked about at the very beginning, hey, tell me where those three forces are. You expanded it to five but tell me where we are with those five forces. That's the chunk on the chessboard that I need. Boom, now I know how to take that next move. The mechanism That's what I want to try to give to people, okay? That's why I have the mm. um, animated video on YouTube. That's why I have the book, because it's like watching the same movie happen over and over again. Mm. You can see it, and you understand the cause-effect relations so you can understand. So when you ask questions like, um, you know, how do you get better? And then we go deal with the mechanics of that. Like, okay, how do you get, get financially better off? And how do you be good with each other and not be threatened? I mean, it's just, 
if you look at it that way and you understand the mechanics, <clears throat> it is what it is. That's how reality works. And then how do you deal with it? Makes a lot of sense. Okay. So in terms of chunking, in terms of understanding where we are in the cycle, um, one thing that I'm thinking a lot about is as we go into the 2024 election, um, I've heard credible people say that they think China is going to make a move on Taiwan in the sort of chaos of the division that we have here in the current global superpower. Um, do you see that as a logical move on the chessboard for China? Is that something that seems plausible to you? Um, I have um, very good contact. Um, so I have close Contacts of on both sides, and um, and and so I'm just wanting to say it rather than just throwing out an opinion. I my opinion is that um, there's a political situation in the United States that that it's really the issue of the, how much the United States pushes the issue in Taiwan uh, that makes it uh, risky. Because um, there's a um, uh, a move for uh, of let's say hawks or um, some uh, to um, defend uh, Taiwan or uh, so. Let me just give you the facts. If there is a, I'm going to give you a little history. Okay. Please. Um, Taiwan was part of China. Um, and around 1840, foreign powers came into China and they wanted to trade and do things with, with China and China didn't want to do that. And so around that time, um, they had the Opium Wars, you may have heard that in history, in which um, the, um, the Chinese at the time said, I, I don't want to trade, you don't have anything that I want. And um, then they brought in opium that the Chinese wanted so that they would have this trade and whatever, and then militarily won and took over large parts of China, took control of that. And in 1895, um, it was many foreign powers. And in 1895, Japan takes uh, Taiwan. Um, okay, fast forward. Um, you go into uh, World War II. And after World War II, the winners of the war get to divide up the world and said, who, who gets what? And Taiwan was given back to China. That's 1945. Then they have a civil war. Um, oh, as usual, the left and the right, they fight each other. And so the capitalists get kicked out by the communists and they go to Taiwan and they control Taiwan. Okay, so everybody agrees um, that China is part of Taiwan is part of China, but they argue who who controls China. The ones in Taiwan say, "Oh, we control China," and the ones in Beijing say, "We control China." But everybody agrees with that. Fifty years ago, <clears throat> so that's a that's a big issue in their mind because it's part of China, and it's been told to them that it's part of China. Taiwan's part of China, and but it uh, but they the um capitalists, uh, which is called the Kuomintang, they are living in Taiwan and, and they're not controlling it. So Henry Kissinger um, first makes the, um, gets together, goes to China and deals with reunification and then Nixon follows. And, um, and there's this argument and they reiterate that um, Taiwan is part of China. Everybody agrees on that. And that 
there should be peaceful unification of China. And that goes on 50 years now and brings it up, up to where we are today. Okay, uh, so a red line for China is if the United States um, or Taiwan says Taiwan should be an independent country, that would produce a war. And everybody knows that. All those in government would know that would produce a war. Um, this is a big thing for them. You know, in other words, they call that period of time 100 years of humiliation. It was taken, it's promised back, and, and whatever, it's it's in, in, in their mind an indisputable reality. Um, now we're in a situation in which um, the United States, and particularly um, some uh, congressmen who are more hawkish, um, say, uh, what good chance they will say, uh, we will militarily defend Taiwan and then go on and sell them more um, military equipment. Um, so it's very, very close to saying, I will, um, it's a separate state. So we're very, very close to that particular issue. So what will come, um, I don't believe China is going to initiate a move to, to take control of, China, of Taiwan um, unless the United States crosses that line, pushes that line. Now, so the way that it is understood, and just by different part parties, um, is it's understood by the Chinese to be the way I describe it. Look, it's been promised, it's here, you know, um, I mean, don't, no, <laughs> that's an uncompromisable thing. And Americans, um, I think, think about um, this, um, communist dictatorial bully that is trying to take a free country a free people and um in a um you know um aggressive way take over them and that we need to defend liberty and protect them from that Okay, um, I just want to emphasize um, it's more complicated than that in the way that I said. And also, it's like, um, from uh, the Chinese point of view, it's part of the American containment strategy, which means, you know, China has grown and it's become a higher percentage of world economy and so on, and it's expanding. And it's like Taiwan is the lid on this boiling pot. So that's my best description of what the situation is. So I wouldn't expect, I would say, um, if you want to know what really happens, uh, watch it the way I describe it. In other words, is it unprovoked? Or is, or is it provoked in the way I just described it? Mm -hmm. Now, again, I'm a very realistic person. I'm not an ideological person. I'm not trying to, okay. I'm just like, how does the, how does reality work? And what's the move? And what's the next move? And I'm just trying to describe that reality. I'm not taking a side in it. It's just like two sides in a chessboard. And I'm just looking down at the chessboard the process of getting those two things aligned, tying this into meditation. So in my own experience, meditation is a, a stillness. It's a quiet from the chatter of the mind and more maybe profoundly than that, I can feel my brain shifts into a different gear. So maybe it's less uh, linear thinking, it's more lateral, I'm making connections that I might not otherwise make. So is it in, in that still, in that quiet, 
where you're able to look at your what's bubbling up from beneath the limbic system, your, your emotional life, you're able to look at that without judgment, and then able to say, okay, but this is what I'm trying to do sort of consciously, these are my plans and all of that, and now how do I, are you altering either of them or are you beginning to say, I need to understand if this is a useful emotional driver or a destructive emotional driver. Like, what is that process? I think you describe it very well. Um, and when you go deeper, by the way, you go literally into your subconscious. So you're creating a connection. When you transcend, I do transcendental meditation. When you transcend, I am not conscious and I'm not unconscious. I am in the subconscious. I, I'm not aware, uh, but if somebody went make a little noise like that, boom, I would, I would, so it's not like being asleep. And that's also, by the way, where creativity comes from. It, you know, it's like you go take a hot shower and a great idea comes, not because you're muscling it. So when you're having that, then um, you're calm and your natural state, and then these things bubble up and it helps that alignment. So you say, uh, okay, let me look, go above myself. Let me, let me go above myself and look at myself within the context of my circumstances. What is around me? How does that work? How does reality work? Okay, if I do this, what are the consequences? And so the, the going above it and just saying, I'm responsible for my decisions, my life, and how do I navigate the things, the things there that I can pull the levers of, to who do I get, how do I do, how do I deal with those, and going above it in that calm way is really what it's about. And when you do it well with others, so you triangulate. That's why I have the radical truthfulness and the radical transparency. When you have that radical truthfulness and the radical transparency, you're triangulating with others. You're going above it with them and you're just looking at that circumstance and you say, okay, well, we're in the same goal or are we? And then how do I navigate those so that we get to where we want to go? Because if you're forming your company, you've got your company, we're on the same mission together, right? So now let's all go above ourselves. What are your strengths and weaknesses? How do we get at what's true? And how do we do that with transparency? And that's it. Yeah, oh man, so, so powerful. And putting it into action, I'm really seeing exactly how it begins to um, allow, and I think truth is probably the, what you call hyperrealism, the getting to such an objective look at what is true. Um, and going back to, sort of an objective look at that emotional state, which I think is where a lot of people struggle. One of the biggest and most profound, probably the only lightning rod moment in my life where it's like, whoa, my life can be divided into before that literal like instantaneous recognition and after everything is completely different. And that was the first time where I realized that I was being driven by something that I had not yet recognized, which was I was telling everybody that I wanted to generate wealth in my life, but I was acting like I just wanted people to tell me that I was smart. And so the, the like friction between those like hit this collision. And so at the time I was just a copywriter and the guys who would later become my partners at the time were my employers. And we got in this huge fight over something stupid. And I was arguing and arguing and arguing for my idea. I, I needed my idea to win because I had, they were just so much farther ahead than me. They were smarter than me in that they can process data faster and, and that, that's just true. Like they could think through things more rapidly than I could. So I was like, I have an inferiority complex over how fast they think and they're like 15 years ahead of me as entrepreneurs. So I just always feel like a buffoon. And so I'm starting to really feel badly about myself. And so I'm arguing for this dumb idea, arguing, 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 and then finally I wear them down and they agree. And I was like, shit, I know it's the wrong idea. Like there's a voice in my head screaming, you know this is a stupid idea, stop arguing for it. But I needed to win. And so when they left, I thought, okay, whoa, what, what's real? I, I just need to know what's real. No judgment on me. If what you want is to get rich, you have to change the way that you're acting immediately. But if what you really want is to just feel smart, you need to leave this company because butting heads with them every day and feeling inferior is, is never gonna get you there. And so in that I realized, wait, there's actually a third option where I could value myself entirely for learning. 
And if I switched my identity over from being smart, being right, being good, being worthy to just, I learn, that's what I do, then everything will change. And it did literally like that. Like I remember that day so clearly. So to me, what you're describing is just another one of those. Right. You have to go go deeper on that concept. The notion that everything loops, that history repeats, because I think people get it from like a U.S. history class, but they don't necessarily understand it in their own life. There's practically nothing that hasn't happened before, really, if you look at the theme. So when I take your your particular case, I'll, I can digress into it, but I won't. I, I won't. I'll come back to that in in a second. Almost everything that happens has happened many, many times before. And just like I described, there's the hero's journey and there's this and that, there's that particular path, and the whole thing happens over and over again. So my reaction um, to what you're saying is, um, yep, yeah, that's absolutely right, that's a winning strategy. So if you step back from that and you write, okay, what happened to you? What, we're t what happened to you is what we're talking about. You went above yourself, okay? My so you exemplify it. You, okay, here are the things. You went above yourself. Now you could have had the ego thing, the big O barrier. Okay, the ego barrier is going to be the thing that's sort of going to kill you. Then by reconciling what your subliminal desires were, okay, I want to be judged as smart, and then connecting that with your intellect and saying, okay, now intellect, what is really going on here? Okay, and then to be able to step out of that. Now, you just did it alone, but you could do it with others, and it's even better. And, and so you figure out, oh, okay, this is that. Here's what the choices are. Here's what, how reality works. And so I'm just saying, you did what we were talking about, right? And if everybody, if everybody gets that and really understands how to go do that, the, number, the two big things is, how do you get uh, your alignment of your lower level you with your upper level you? How do you get um, past your ego and your blind spot? And we know what the ego barrier is, like I gotta be right, or whatever it is, or I'm not good at this. The blind spot barrier is the realization that people actually see things different. They see different things. Like somebody will see the big picture, somebody will see the detail. They'll focus on different things, almost like a color spectrum type of thing. And if you realize that you will see a part of that spectrum and other people will see the other part of the spectrum, and so that you really need to, when you go above yourself, you really need to orchestrate all those ways of seeing. Because you are not just one of those people that's got to do it yourself. Your way of being the, the success is to go above it and be the orchestrator and know what you're good at and what you're not good at. So it's almost like if you want your life to be successful, you will not let yourself do certain things because you're just no good at them. Once you get that picture down, then you can find the paths wherever the paths are. You're open-minded because you, now you've given up your ego barrier and your blind spot barrier. So your particular case just was another one of those. Yeah, the concept of just another one of those, I think is, um, it's bizarrely easy to miss in your book. And so I want to linger on this point for a second. And it's funny because people ask you this question all the time and you give the same answer. You're so consistent. And yet people don't spend the time that you spend. So let me encapsulate. Uh, you've done so well as an investor. It's kind of crazy. And so needless to say, people are like, all right, what's the strategy? And your answer is actually usually not specific. Your answer is understand the historical context. Understand the historical context and get smart people around you so you're not making decisions by yourself. So the notion of it's another one of those is looking at investing, looking at the human condition, looking at your own life as this thing that has these repeating elements. Every dimension of every, everything, the way is another one of those. And um, so that's how you could, if I can get people to think, what I want to convey what that means, and then I, I want to then understand how to think at the principle level, because then life becomes so much easier, because if you have the principle. And what I mean by that is, um, like you could look at all the things that are coming at you, and they're just the things coming at you. If you instead uh, think of each thing as being like a type of species, think of that as an, like an animal species or something. Okay, what one of those is it? And how do I deal with those? And you have your principle for dealing with those. 
So you have the species coming in, you have right. a principle that lines up with the species, yeah. so now there's no guesswork or refiguring it out. Right, figure it's like, um, I don't know, it's a, a type of snake that's coming at you. But everything is another one of those. So when you start to think about how do I deal with that, how does reality work, and how do I deal with those? So the way it looks to me, I'm, I'll speak figuratively to help to convey the image of what I mean by that, Maybe there is something like 50 different personality types. I don't know what the exact number is. And they are all living out the same scripts. Hopping. Maybe they're just 50 different scripts. And then through those, you know, maybe there's a certain X hundred things through time. And it seems all confusing because we're looking at them bit, bit by bit. You know, it's like you're in a blizzard, in a snowstorm, and each of these bits come at you and so on. If you can kind of step back and just say, okay, okay, what one of those is it? And it's happened before, and it's happened to different people. So let's say, for example, you have a kid, and you think, okay, now I'm a kid. And you could just sort of say, okay, now you're parenting. But whatever it is, you can sort of say, hey, it's happened before a million times, and in that particular circumstances. So when you realize everything happens over and over again, pretty much for the same kind of reasons, okay, and you understand that, and you can almost look at um, who, who, who's been through it before, who knows how it works, how do I best navigate that thing, what are my principles for that, then it's great. The reason I discovered it accidentally, I discovered this accidentally, is because I got in the habit that I suggest you get into and other people get into. And that is, um, whenever you're in a situation where you're making a decision, important decision, just pause and write down what type of decision was it and why did I make that decision that way? That's writing down your principles. It's kind of your recipe for success. And we could talk about it. And then every time I'm in a situation, I'll write down, why did I make that decision? And we could look at those criteria. Did that make sense to do that decision that way? Would you have different criteria? And so on. And you do that over a period of time, okay? And then you have your principles. And then, it, so they're just your reasons for making your decisions and, and what matters to you, right? When you do that, so that's why I'm encouraging you because you're going through these and then you have found a path in life. I viewed your story, what you just told me, is just another one of those. Now you keep doing it, it'll become apparent to you how everything's another one of those because what'll happen is the next time around, you're gonna find, I don't know, let's say you're firing somebody, use that as an example, you would say, okay, now I'm firing somebody, again. Okay, now let me just kind of reflect, would I modify that principle and how would I do that? And then, okay, now maybe you, you're firing somebody who's been with you for 10 years and you love. And that's not the same as firing the son of a bitch who you <laughs> want to get rid of. So then you refine that. How, how should I deal with that one and that? And why does it make sense? Because that reflection, why does it make sense? Why does it make sense? And really wanting truthfulness. You, you know, not worried about being embarrassed. Making mistakes. We're only on the struggle with all of you together is a good thing. Yeah, so the how do you define a species? Like how do you begin to codify all this stuff and go, because I, I think it's all too easy to get lost in the, well, this isn't another one of those. This isn't just firing somebody, this is firing somebody that I love. And so, no, there's, you know, this oh, is all simple. just so different. It's simple because all you have to do really is to sort of say, if you start to think everyone's another one and I was when I'm making the decision, I just got to write down why I made the decision. I don't care how you title it. Okay, just write down, okay, uh, okay. What's, what, what are your criteria? Make it, write it down. Well, you'll see that they're close cousins. You know, let's say if you're saying, <clears throat> is it a different one because it's a close relationship that you've had for a long time or somebody is new? Okay, well, you'll see those two things are close together, okay. But it's another one of those things. And it changes your way of seeing things, okay? It changes your perspective. Again, I want to repeat, because then life becomes easier because it's not all these bits and pieces. Okay, it's okay, it's another one of those. It gives you an equanimity, and like a ninja. Okay, it's another one of these coming at me. Okay, and how do I approach this? And then you can have a conversation. It's just reality. How should you deal with that reality? And if you do that, 
then you think in a whole different way, okay? You just wanna to get to the best way to deal with your realities. You've talked about how about 30% of the people cannot do radical candor. Be great for you to- I call it radical transparency, but whatever Perfect. it is, okay? So Either radical way. transparency, define what that is exactly, and then what is it about that 30%? Like, are they, they can't get rid of the ego, or what? What is that? It's just what you're talking about. This, the struggle is between themselves as you go into a conversation, and, uh, and you're looking at that. Um, um, they find so the Almost radical all transparency them, is saying super hard shit, really direct, nice and clear, they're not good at this. Yeah, yeah say, while simultaneously saying, I don't know if that's true. In other words, if I say that I don't, I don't think you're good at that, I'm being honest, but also who knows whether you're good at that. Right. <laughs> so how do we then go from, you think you're good at it, I don't think you're good at it, and how do we go through a process to find out together whether you're good at it or not? How do we go okay. through the process? That well, would be you, one of my key questions. Okay, the best way to do it is you do it in an agreed upon way, okay? The idea is, okay, we say, okay, Tom, you're not so good at that, I don't think. Okay, and then we go through the, uh, how would we judge? Can we ask other people? Do we go through this test or that test? How do we find out what's true? Because if you can find out what's true, your life will be better. Like, do you want to know what you're not good at? If you know what you're not good at, it's, your life's no problem because it, you don't even have to get good at it. You just have to work with somebody who's good at what you're not good at, right? So there's a path forward. When you get out of your head that you gotta do that. So the only basic notion is, when we're, if we were to have a relationship is, if you, and by the way, it's non-hierarchical. You could say, hey, Ray, I don't think you're very good at that. And I'm, I'm gonna be the same way. I put it in because I needed it. Because I'm worried that I'm gonna be wrong. So uh, then you come to me and you say, I don't think it's very good. Well, how do we find out in a non-ego constrained, objective way whether I'm good at that or not? Do you actually lay out criteria? Like, oh yeah, here's you'll how do. we're gonna... You'll, yeah, you'll, we will do, yeah. Absolutely. You'll, how do you come upon that criteria? Would you do this as a one-on-one? -on -one? Would you do this in a group? Um, how do you begin to tease that stuff out? Um, first of all, in terms of the group, um, I like to make everything transparent so it, it, everybody could watch the same thing happening with anybody. So I Meaning like- you would do this in front of a large group of people? No, no, I would say taping. Uh, we do a lot of that radical transparency because that way people see, is it fair? Is it a good process, right? So I like to do that discussion, but anybody can do it with anybody, right? And so, but I would like to have that conversation if it's like, if, if I don't think you are good at something and I am relevant to your life or vice versa, we gotta work it out. We gotta figure that out together. Would you do this with your wife? In all relationships, in one way or another, you have to find out how you're going to make decisions. There are going to be agreements and disagreements and you have to have the art of thoughtful disagreement. Now people find their domains differently. Maybe somebody says, oh, okay, I'll take care of these things and you take care of that. I don't know, some people, uh, you know, the traditional household might say, okay, I'll take care of making the money out and the man goes out and he makes money in the world and then one woman says, I'll take care of the kids. We're not there anymore. But each role I'm trying to say, in some way you have to find out how to do the art of thoughtful disagreement. It's, and it makes sense. And then also knowing what's good, what you're good at and what you're not good at. It's a good thing to know what you're good at and what you're not good at, right? What do you do though, like when you, let's say you and your wife realize, ooh, we actually have something that we disagree with how to do with the kids. And that's high stakes. If you do something wrong, you could have a material impact on, on their psyche and the way that they approach the world. So there's sort of elevated stakes and there's just two of you, unless you guys had a way of appealing to other people. Would it come down, because you've said, um, don't worry so much about what the person's saying, think about the process by which they got there. Yeah, so I'm saying, whenever there's a disagreement between two people that they can't get along on that, they should pause and they should go above it, and they should say, um, how, do we, how should we deal with each other when that happens? In other words, what are our protocols for um, working ourselves through that 
so that we can then move beyond that to make a decision. And would a specific protocol in a marriage be something like, if it has to do with the kids, you have more believability than I do, so therefore, if we can't come to an agreement, we'll go with your decision? There are, that could be one of the protocols. The main thing I'm trying to convey is when people are ordinarily in an argument, they just argue. And they, and, the, and they don't know the ground rules, they don't have a process in place. So if you look above it and you come up with whatever your rules are, it may be you could have domain, it may be that you have a mutually agreed party that you would say, okay, let's plead our cases to and have them mediate it. It could be a lot of different paths could exist to say, ah, oh, I think that's a good path when we have a disagreement on how we plead our cases and then move beyond it. But you need to have the path. And that's what I mean by principled level thinking. Go above it. How should it be? Instead of, you know, this type of thing, right? We all need that in order to have successful relationships. It's fundamental, right? When you got this and you're not going above it and saying, why do you have this or how should this occur? Then you got trouble. If you really want to understand the complex financial landscape we all face, watch this conversation with Balaji Srinivasan. The problems go all the way to the bedrock of the financial system in terms of treasuries being the new toxic waste. It's going to be at least as bad as 2008, but probably worse than that.